Marissa, what do you tell me all the time about my cooking? You love my cooking, so I need you something. So the video itself, I know, was kind of glitchy, but you all got the point, right? That these kids got something they weren't expecting. And I want to talk today a little bit about ways with which we deal with disappointment and hurt. And overall, just troubling situations. And I bet you, the next time these kids went to open up a present, the next time these kids went into a situation where they're normally very hopeful, because who doesn't love Christmas, right? Who doesn't love getting a box wrapped up and just wanting to be surprised with, with what's in there. Who doesn't want to do that? But these kids, what did they get? They got a banana. They got eggs, right? Which normally, you know, you would like, but that's not what they were expecting. They got a half-eaten sandwich, not even a whole sandwich, a half-eaten sandwich. And by the way, I love that other kid in there saying, you should appreciate what you got. That's before he opened up his present. So, you know, if he showed it a little bit more, you would have seen that happen as well, too. But um, I bet you the next time, though, these kids went into there, went into that kind of situation, the next Christmas, or, the, like, or in a few weeks when they actually got their real presents, they would have went to it, into it with a little bit of a pessimistic attitude now. Because they've been burned already. So the next time they would go into a situation like that, I bet you they wouldn't go into it with the same type of anticipation, the same type of excitement, the same type of hope. And in our passage today, we have Mary, who goes to the tomb, doesn't go in yet, kind of sees the stone rolled away, and just takes off, and goes to grab the disciples, and says, listen, they've taken the body away. And it says that the disciples just come running. And I can imagine the type of, you know, the, the, at the speed they were going at, just running to get to the tomb to see what had happened. And it says that John outran Peter and got to the tomb first. But he didn't go in. It says that he stopped at the tomb and kind of stooped <clears throat> in and looked. And, I, you know, nobody really knows why. I want to stop there for a second because nobody really knows why John stopped. Right? There are a lot of good theories out there. There are some scholars that think that, you know, out of, you know, out of custom, you couldn't go in and be near a dead body or touch a dead body. Some think that maybe it was just symbolic for John to allow Peter to go in there first. So there's a lot of theories out there, but nobody really knows exactly why. So I started thinking about it subjectively. If I was John, would I have been able to go in? If I was John, would I have been in a rush to just get into that tomb? And I started thinking what may have been going on in his mind, in his heart, because imagine this. Imagine spending three years with Jesus. Jesus who equated himself with God. And after a while, he did these things and he said these things that made you, you really believe it. Right? You saw him healing sick people. You saw him feeding thousands with nothing. You saw him, we saw him um, calming storms. And then he taught these amazing things too about how to live and what to expect in the next life. So all these things, you came to admire him. You came to really believe in him. But not just that. After a while, you grew to love him. They called John the disciple of Jesus. Love. You grew to love him. You grew to know him. You grew to just admire him so much that every time you were around him, you just weren't worried about anything. Every time you were around him, you were just hopeful about life. It just felt good to be around him. And then after that, after three years of all that, you're standing here and you're watching him being crucified on a cross. 
completely humiliated, with people spitting on him, people mocking him. And you see him in excruciating pain. And you're witnessing all this. In your head, you're probably thinking, what, where, what went wrong? Where did all this go wrong? And you're sitting there just broken hearted about this. Because this person that you loved, that you gave your last three years to, that you followed and you grew to believe was God, you see this happening now. So then after three days, imagine this. Now you go back home and you're trying to deal with all this. You're trying to come to terms with what happened. Where did everything kind of steer off in the wrong direction? Was I not to believe in the first place? Was I just, was this all a fluke? And on top of that, dealing with the fact that you, somebody you love and you grew to love is gone now. You saw die in front of your eyes. So imagine that pain of trying to deal with that for three days. But then not only that, not only that, now all of a sudden, after coming to terms with this for a while, now Peter, uh, sorry, excuse me, Mary just walks into the room and says, now his body is gone. Now his body's gone. Can you imagine just the utter hopelessness, the utter confusion, the sadness in that situation? If I was John, honestly, I don't think I would have been able to go into that tomb either. I would have been sitting outside that tomb for a while because I would have wanted to have to revisit that pain that I've been trying to get over for the last few days. I would have been able to like open up that wound again that I'm already trying to heal. So I don't know how long I would have been outside that tomb. But the truth of the matter is that all of us, and not to this extent, definitely not to this extent, but we're all dealing with wounds, old situations that are too difficult to confront again. We're all dealing with maybe people in our lives or things that have happened to us that are too hard and too emotionally difficult to have to revisit. For some of us, it may be relationships in our lives. Whether it be between your, you know, within your family itself or within the people around you, within your community, whatever it is, there may be relationships in your lives where we've been burned a couple times. Where we've been opened up ourselves to somebody and either we've been rejected or, or they've said something that hurt our feelings. And after a while you say, okay, you know, let's try to reconcile. And you, and you try and you take one step forward, but all of a sudden they say something or do something to, to um, make you believe it all over again. And you take two steps back. And the more you try, the more you get burned. And after a while, it's just easier just to disconnect, isn't it? Just easier just to walk away and not have to deal with it. For some of us, it may be that we've been burned by church. For some of, you, some of us, it may be a miracle that we're even here today. Because... We've walked into church before, whether it be another church or this church or wherever it is, and we've walked into a church before, and we've expected to feel loved and to feel affirmed and to be, feel acknowledged and to feel welcomed, but instead, what well, we were met with looks and stares. Instead of love, we were uh, met with judgment, or we were rejected, or whatever happened in that community, and you walk in, you're like, well, this is supposed to be a community of love? I'm not feeling it here. And after a while, you keep on getting burned over and over and over again. It's easier just not even have to enter into that situation anymore. For some of us, the issue may be even greater than that. For some of us, maybe we feel like we've been burned by God a few times. Maybe God didn't show up for us at a time when we believed that God should have. And in our pain and in our hurt, we were crying out and God didn't appear for us at a time. And now, how much can you do when you just feel burned? And after a while, you've experienced this type of pain and hurt in your life so many times that you end up becoming numb. You start becoming numb because honestly, sometimes it's easier to have to feel nothing than really have to open yourself up to feeling something, isn't it? It's easier to just close yourself off, your own emotions, the people around you, within you, whatever it is, and have to open yourself up to feel pain and feel hurt. For years, um, starting when I was seven, and probably until, I think it was until my early 20s, I played the violin. And I played quite a bit. And I played, you know, individually, solo. I played in, you know, in my high school orchestra and a little bit beyond that as well, too. I played in competitions. I played quite a bit. 
And what happens is when you first start playing the violin, um, it's not that bad. I mean, you sound horrible, but I mean, it's not that bad. And you're sitting there, you know, hitting those strings, those metal strings, right? And you play for a bit and it's fine, but after a while, with the intensity you're hitting those metal strings, your fingers really start to hurt. And they really start to like, you know, kind of feel, you actually sometimes get little marks on your hands. And um, I mean, I never played to the point of bleeding, but I heard some people kind of in the beginning feel some of that. But your body does this amazing thing over time. Over time, your, your fingers build these calluses. And what you can do is you can play for, for hours on end without really feeling anything in your fingers. Now, for some of us, we don't build, you know, build just body calluses, we build like emotional calluses. Because it's easy for us to not have to feel something, right? It's easier to become numb sometimes because things around us are just too emotionally difficult to deal with times. Too emotionally difficult. And after we get burned a few times, you know, whether it be by situations or people or whatever it is, we end up becoming numb to them and then we become numb to kind of our own emotions of wanting to feel things. And then it's like a cycle, right? Because the more you become numb to your own emotions, the more you start becoming numb to the people around you. And the more you become numb to the people around you, the more you become numb to the situations around you. And, because how many times can you turn on the evening news and see all the horrible things that are going on? How many times can you do that? And most of you are all from the Chicagoland area, I assume, and you all probably know this, that just within the last two and a half months, as of a few weeks ago, we've already had 100 people shot down in the city alone by random acts of gun violence. 100. And if you guys have been here for a while, you know this has been a trend going on for years. And you know, the first few times you hear it happening, you say, oh, well, you know, you know what happened? I'm curious about the situation. Why did this happen? You know, who got affected? Who did the affecting? What happened here? And then it happens maybe two, three, four times, and you say, well, this is a trend now. Let's start having some conversations about what's going on in our neighborhood. Let's start getting together and trying to solve this issue because there's something going on here. But what happens when that happens the 10th time and the 20th time and the 50th time and the 75th time? After a while, how much can you emotionally deal with? How much can you really put up with? And after a while, we just end up becoming numb. Because who can hope in a time like this? And after a while, like John, we end up sitting outside there, outside of our tombs, outside of the situations that are plaguing us and plaguing the people around us, and we sit there too numb to even face it, too numb to go in. Some of us do the exact opposite. So in this story today, we have Mary, who goes to the tomb, it says she didn't even go into the tomb. She saw the tomb, saw the stone rolled away, and automatically started assuming the worst, right? Because any of us would have. I would have assumed the worst, too. And she goes, and what did she do? She runs into action trying to fix it. So she runs and grabs the disciples, it says, and says, I must, you know, it didn't say the conversation, the whole conversation, but she said that they have taken away my Lord, and I'm assuming I would have said, hey, come, let's go find out what's going on. And then she they, it says that the, the, the disciples run back there, but at some point Mary gets back there too. And then in her stress of trying to fix things, in her stress of trying to figure out what's going on, she sees the gardener. She sees the gardener, and she says to the gardener, listen, if you've taken away the body, just give it back to me. Let me bury it. Let me fix this situation. Let me just bring this situation to a close. And the whole time, She's so wrapped up in trying to grab everything, trying to make everything normal again, she doesn't realize that she's talking to Jesus. Now, I think a lot of us, we're kind of living in this constant state of stress, right? Where instead of becoming numb to things, when we were confronted with like difficult or stressful or emotional situations, we do whatever we can to try to just bring it back to normal. And the more that we get piled down, the more we just try to to get everything under control, try to bring some sort of, sort of normalcy back into our lives, the more that happens to us, the more we start moving to try to fix it. 
And sometimes in that state of, 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 of mind, what happens is that we don't realize that God in that situation, God at that time, God at that place may be doing something new, completely new. How often do you all lose your keys? All the time? Um, and my family's going to laugh because it, it happened to me this morning. Literally happened to me like an hour and a half ago. And, you know, I'm getting better at it now. I'm trying to come into the habit of, like, you know, putting my, my keys back up on top of that key holder. But um, I, there was a time when I would lose my keys like two or three times a week. It was pathetic. And what I realized is there's a very high correlation between how long it takes me to find my keys when I am in a rush to get somewhere. When I'm already, already stressed out and trying to find, um, when I'm trying to find my keys where I'm already thinking about where I'm supposed to be, because I hate being late. I completely hate being late. So for me, I just get stressed out, and then I'm sitting there and I'm looking through all my drawers, random drawers, I'm yelling at my kids saying, what'd you guys do with my keys? And they're sitting there going, we're three and five, why don't we have your keys, we can't drive. And I'm sitting there just like looking in places that it shouldn't be there, then I go to my desk, and I look at my desk where there's so much other stuff that is piled on there from all the other things I'm trying to juggle at the same time. I don't realize that my keys are right there in front of me, but because in the state of just stress, of rush, of hurry, of trying to just bring normal things back into, you know, bring some sort of normalcy into the situation, just trying to get back on the path, I don't see that my either keys are right in front of me, or honestly, 35% of the time, they're probably just in my pockets. But when I'm not in a rush, I can take a second, and when I'm, I'm not stressed out about trying to be somewhere, I can take a second to sit there and think back just for a second, what was I doing last when I had my keys? What pants were I wearing? What jacket was I wearing? And I'm able to find it much more quickly because I can trace my steps back just by taking a second and finding my keys and wherever I left it. And I can literally, I mean, I'm not kidding around, it takes me like 30 seconds in that situation to find it, and it takes me like five minutes in the other to find it. Now, I understand it's a stretch. I'm not comparing losing your keys to losing Jesus' body. Okay, I understand it's not a one-to-one -one apples to apples comparison. But the point I'm trying to make is that in those times of distress in our lives, sometimes we are so busy just trying to control everything, so busy just trying to balance everything in our lives. Maybe balancing being a single parent with like kids at home. Maybe balancing, trying to balance like your blooming business with everything else going on in your life. Maybe trying to balance your failing business and everything going on in your life. Trying to grapple with your finances. Trying to grapple with all like the issues that we all end up facing and confronting. And we're so busy in trying to just control it, just trying to you know maximize our time. We're so busy that we don't slow down to realize that God may be doing something new. We don't slow down to sit there and think, maybe I should take a moment for myself for reflection, for prayer, and to sit there and find out that maybe God, in this moment, is doing something new, because all those things happen at the expense sometimes of our own spiritual lives. And we sit there just running around, not realizing that God is telling us to slow down in that moment, and that God may be doing something new, something completely new. So some of us, like I said, deal with difficult situations like John. Some of us are like Mary. And most of us fall somewhere in between there where we take some situations like John, some like Mary, right? We kind of do, do it based on the situation. But in both cases, in both cases, we've kind of lost hope. Hope that anything good can come out of the situation. Hope that God can do anything. Either we're trying to control us so much or ignoring it. But here's the interesting part of the story. It wasn't until they finally confronted the issue. It wasn't until John finally went into that tomb. It wasn't until Mary finally went into that tomb that they saw that God was doing something incredible. God was doing something that confounded their imaginations, confounded their expectations. Because isn't that what Easter is all about? It's about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the resurrection of our hopes. Where God does something so amazing, so incredible, so beyond what we could even thought God could do. Where he brings to life what we thought was dead. Literally brings to life what we thought was dead. 
And a lot of times in our lives, it's not that God isn't working but or doing anything. It's God that we're not paying attention because we haven't got into these situations with we're trying to do that. And we, when we stop paying attention, we either we start stop losing hope and we start going back to our own ways of trying to balance things, our own ways of trying to deal with things. And a lot of times we fall into the same trap where we're sitting there not doing anything because we have no hope or trying to do too much and trying to control everything because we have no hope. And I think it's time for us, some of us, a lot of us, I'm assuming all of us really, to revisit some of our tombs. But to go in with a state of like expectation, walking and saying, what is God going to do with this? Where is God moving in this? Expecting God to do something. You know why? Because hope allows us to take some risks in our lives. Hope allows us to walk into situations and it spurs us into actions to take on things, to confront situations in a brand new way. Not just by trying to do what we can, but trying to walk in and take in a second and say, where is God in all this? How is God moving here? What can, and what can I do to get on board? What can I do to get, what is God telling me in this situation? And I'm going to close with this. I think one of the, at least one of my key takeaways from this was that God is calling us to do this type of activity together. Because if it wasn't for the fact that Mary came and got the disciples, who knows how long it would have been until they saw the tomb. If it wasn't for the fact that Peter ran right in, who knows how long John would have been sitting there? Who knows? Right? They were able to empower each other to confront that difficult situation. They were able to empower each other to be able to go in and do things that they couldn't do alone. How amazing is that? And then, not only that, Jesus showed up for them in completely different ways. Jesus showed up for them in completely different ways. For John, is he was able to go in there, see the head cloth there, and start thinking, okay, God is doing something here. For Mary, it took Jesus to say her name out loud, where we, she started paying attention and realized that Jesus was alive and well and working. For Peter, it was a little bit later, but they were able to testify to what they saw, empowered each other, and empower the people around them. Being able to proclaim that God is alive and well and working and doing something. And as a community, they went on to do these amazing things. They went on to build these communities of love and hope where they knew the truth of a God that was constantly working. They knew the truth of a Jesus that had risen. And they built these amazing communities where they ate together and they, they took care of each other and they worshiped God together. And they looked around and they found the people around them that needed hope. They found the people that around them that needed something. And they found like the, you know, the widows and the orphans. And they took them in and took care of them. They did these amazing things because they were empowered by this new sense of hope. And that's the kind of community we're called to be. Where we come together in our difficulties. Where we come together with things that are plaguing us, right? Either individually or as a society. And we're able to go into these situations empowering each other to do it together. And then being open to the ways in which God is working and testifying to each other about the ways that God is breathing new life into our situations where God is breathing new breath into things that we thought were dead, where God is bringing back to life that we think were, was dead. That's the kind of community we're called to be. A community of outrageous hope, ridiculous hope, knowing that God isn't done yet. And he's calling us not only to take part in it, but to proclaim it to everybody we know.